Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to episode four of the Home and Energy Chats webinar series, Landscaping with Native Plants. My name is Heather Chandler, and I am the owner and publisher of the Green and Healthy Maine Homes magazine. I would like to start by sharing a special thank you to our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor for this year's Home and Energy Chats, Royal River Heat Pumps. Specializing in the comfort and efficiency of your home, Royal River Heat Pumps offers the highest quality electric heat pump installation and service in Maine. Call for a no-cost site visit with one of their design experts or check them out online at royalriverheatpumps.com. I would also like to thank our season sponsor, Bath Savings, a local Maine bank that proudly invests in the people, places, and businesses that make Maine strong. Bath Savings, your neighbor, your bank. So a quick overview of the evening, we will begin the webinar with a presentation from each of our panelists, and then we'll be opening it up to discussion uh, with Q&A. So please submit any questions you have for our panelists using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to them all. We did have quite a few come in through the registration process, so thank you for that. And a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our website, greenmainhomes.com. So if for some reason you have to take off a little early, uh, that should be up within the next few days. Um, and you can also share it with any friends. So if you are unfamiliar with us, Green and Healthy Maine Homes is a multimedia brand dedicated to inspiring healthy, sustainable, energy smart, and future ready Maine homes through an online business directory, biannual print magazines, monthly email newsletter, and an active social media presence on Facebook and, and Instagram. We share expert advice to inspire healthy, comfortable, affordable, efficient, and sustainable Maine homes. Please visit greenmainhomes.com to learn more. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. As the program manager of Wild Seed Project, Anna Bielkoff works to further, further the organization's educational programming, deepen relationships with partner organizations, and catalyze a movement to rewild Maine. Before joining Wild Seed Project, Anna was senior horticulturist at the Native Plant Trust Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts, where she designed and installed native plant gardens, managed interns and volunteers, and taught the public ways to incorporate native plants in their own gardens. So welcome, Anna. I'd also like to introduce A.V. Clare. In 2015, A.V. Clare co-founded the Native Gardens of Blue Hill, along with Kathy Rees, to demonstrate the value and beauty of native plants and ecological gardening practices. This volunteer project has blossomed through grants and support from the surrounding community. Avi's day job for the past 30 years has been the creation of garden landscapes and her journey to gardening has its origins in fine art. So welcome Avi. And last but not least, Eric Topper has over 20 years of experience teaching and managing environmental education programs in diverse settings for all ages. He oversees all educational programs at Maine Audubon, including school programs, camps, family events and trips as well as the organization's Bringing Nature Home Native Plant Restoration Initiative. So welcome, Eric. I'm excited to have you all with us this evening for what I know will be a very informative and timely presentation. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Anna to kick off the presentations this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I really appreciate um, being invited to this event and being able to discuss native plants with Avi and Eric. Um, so I, I, as uh, Heather said, I am the project manager for Wild Seed Project. Um, I've been here just about a year now um, this month. And um, so before that, I actually was working at Garden in the Woods. So I'll give you a little bit more information about that in a moment. But if you're not familiar with Wild Seed Project, we're a small but growing um, nonprofit in Portland, Maine, and we do several things. We sell seeds of native plants. Uh, those are wild type seeds, and I'll explain more about that in a little bit. 
Um, we just generally promote the use of native plants in all landscape settings. We really would love people to be feel empowered to restore native plants in their landscapes, whether they be rural, urban, or somewhere in between. And um, we, we actually put out a publication annually. Uh, this year's publication is a native tree guide. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Next slide. So at Garden in the Woods, that's a 45 acre botanical garden in Framingham, Massachusetts. It's the headquarters of Native Plant Trust and Native Plant Trust is a conservation organization primarily. Um, they work to conserve native plants in all New England states. Um, so at Garden in the Woods, um, conservation and horticulture meet. And it's a place of beautiful display gardens, but also um, where seed collection happens, research trials, and lots of experimentation, thinking about using native plants in our in various landscape settings. It's a woodland garden, so um, it's filled with trees and there are um, open areas for meadows. And there I had a chance to uh, both collaborate on some designs and lead designs, um, both in the Curtis Woodland Garden, uh, working with Gary Smith, he redesigned the Curtis Woodland Garden, and then we installed it over several years. Um, and you can see in that upper left-hand picture, there's uh, Phlox and Foamflower, a classic duo that is said to have originated at Garden in the Woods with its founder, Will Curtis. Um, and then in the, the meadow actually was a design that I had the opportunity to help lead um, we planted partridge pea and grasses and native wildflowers into it with plugs. Um, and then the partridge pea lasted for several years as the longer lived perennials and grasses took hold. Um, and then you can see in the bottom left, bottom right, um, there is kind of a lawn alternatives area. It looks like kind of a, a home um, landscape. That's our idea garden and that's where we had trialed um, different species of lawn alternatives like the Pennsylvania sedge um, and a green roof and a, a gathering space that kind of takes the shape of a council ring. So a place where homeowners can get inspiration for their own landscapes. Next slide. At Wild Seed Project, um, I've really tried to bring in my experience in horticulture and design. Um, and to be able to teach people about native plants, but bring it to a place where uh, people feel like they can do it themselves, where they don't necessarily need to hire a designer to make their gardens look beautiful with native plants. So we have this new initiative called the Pledge to Rewild. And um, it's a recently launched program that encourages people to rewild their landscapes or restore their landscapes with native plants in, um, areas where they might have, you know, backyard or, you know, stoops or balconies where they may just have room for containers or rural areas um, in public spaces and private um, residences. So it's something that everyone can take part in, a community effort. Um, and rewilding starts with the idea uh, that native plants are the basis of our food webs. Um, a lot of the research from Doug Tellamy um, and his book, uh, nature's Best Hope inspired the Pledge to Rewild. So thinking of plants as the basis of our food webs, we can learn that, you know, there's been a lot of research that has shown a link to um, the importance of how insects rely on native plants and then in turn, in turn birds and other wildlife rely on insects and native plants um, for their well-being. So if we can plant native plants and increase the native plant biomass in all these landscape settings, then we'll help keep those food webs intact. Next slide. Um, and rewilding, the first action step that you might receive um, when you pledge to rewild in the form of um, an email that's kind of given as free guidance and tools and resources uh, for rewilding with that first um, piece of guidance would be to plant native trees that support these local food webs. So um, Doug Tellamy recognizes that 
plants are keystone species. Many plants are keystone species, uh, not just the large predators uh, like the wolf um, to, that help keep our ecosystems in balance. Um, oaks, willows, cherries, birches, and poplars are some of the top species that support butterfly and moth caterpillars. Um, and those are really, really essential to um, songbird families in spring um, as the adults are feeding their young. It's like a perfect little protein rich sausage for a bird. Um, and there's so many other insects and wildlife that rely on trees as well. Trees also, you know, um, provide all sorts of ecosystem services like um, shading hot urban areas and cooling them, soaking up stormwater. Um, so there's so many reasons to plant native trees. And um, this wild black cherry is supporting, you know, over 400 species of moths and butterflies. And at Garden in the Woods, I had the opportunity to also raise um, giant silk moths as well as butterflies and get to learn about their life cycles and what native plants they rely on. So the Cecropia silk moth is one of the largest silk moths. It's a bird size really. Um, and black cherry is one of its preferred hosts. So it's caterpillars feed on the leaves and then they um, overwinter um, uh, hanging on the branches um, as uh, cocoons, and then they emerge in, in May um, as butterflies and spend a very short time in their lives as butterfly, uh, or sorry, as caterpillar, um, as moths, adult uh, winged moths, uh, where they just reproduce and then um, die within a few days. Um, so, you know, you can see how they're important for this species, but also there's many species of um, butterfly and moths that actually utilize um, other things like leaves to overwinter and to finish their life cycles too. So next slide. Um, so the lawns really take up a huge amount of space in the US. Um, if you think about it, the, the suburban and urban matrix um, is almost takes up almost half the land space at, in the country. And a good portion of that is lawn. Lawns are one of the most irrigated crops in the US. So there's a lot of reasons to reduce lawns as well as to increase native plant biomass. And we can start by, you know, even thinking about shrinking our lawns in half. We don't have to necessarily get rid of them all together, but they're, they are helpful for pathways and places for recreation and gathering spaces. And we can keep a nice mowed edge to signify um, that the place is cared for, keep that cue to care. Well, we might let other spaces rewild um, into meadows. Um, we might plant layers of um, native plants um, and the more layers, the better because that increases our native plant biomass. Um, next slide. And we can just generally think about filling every open niche removing those portions of lawn, maybe even removing portions of blacktop in our cities um, and planting native plants in their place where we can. Um, so, you know, plants like beach plum will grow really well in urban and suburban areas along the edge of a driveway or a health strip and they provide fruit for us and for wildlife as well as wild strawberry. You can plant things that can, into containers, um, really just fill any niche you can and really think about that height structure of canopy trees, understory trees, shrubs, taller perennials, and ground layer plants. Next slide. And so what we plant is just as important as how we manage those plantings. So if we just plant native species but don't manage them wisely, then we'll take away those opportunities for um, wildlife to complete their life cycles. So for an example, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly uh, relies on just a few host plants to complete its life cycle. Um, the white turtle head is one of those main host plants and it lays its eggs on the underside of the white turtle head leaves in spring. Um, and then it, um, those eggs hatch and they stay together. They're a gregarious group. So they move along the plant together and form a protective webbing around them that also helps them uh, once they finish off a branch, they can kind of 
bring that webbing onto another branch and all kind of use that as a bridge to get to the next one. Um, they forage for a good portion of the season and then in the winter, they actually have to overwinter in the leaf litter because they take two um, growing seasons to complete their life cycles. So that's really important to take note of. Then they crawl back up the next growing season, keep eating and storing calories until they can finally um, pupate and form these absolutely gorgeous chrysalises. Um, then the cycle starts over again. Next slide. So if we can leave our leaves, then we can protect overwintering grounds and year round habitat for um, pollinators as well as salamanders and frogs and um, things like bumblebees that overwinter either in the leaf litter or right below it. Um, we can also leave standing vegetation for cover and protection and forage for birds over the winter, those non-migrating birds. And all of this is really important to, you know, this organic material can break down and build living soil for those micro and macro organisms and insulate plant roots. Um, which is especially important nowadays since we don't always have snow cover through the winter. So next slide. Um, so at Wild Sea Project, we really hope people can learn and ex get excited about growing your own native plants from seed for several reasons. One is that as we teach people about native plants, the demand for them grows and the um, Nurseries in Maine especially are not necessarily, we don't have enough supply to equip everybody with the native plants they might need, though it's growing. So if we demand it, it will, it will, um, it will come. But uh, we can also, we, while we might source some native plants from local nurseries that are, that are, you know, doing good practices like growing plants without systemic pesticides and if possible growing plants from seed and using organic practices in general, that's great. We can also grow our own. And seed grown native plants have a variety of uh, benefits. They're uh, putting, when you when you grow a seed grown native plant, you're putting more genetic diversity out into the world. So most nurseries will actually um, uh, clone their plants, um, do cuttings or grow them from tissue culture, which are all asexual methods of reproduction. And that just makes, makes sure that we have genetically identical individuals. And those individuals will not necessarily um, have adaptations to stressors of climate change, things like drought tolerance and um, flooding tolerance and tolerance to uh, swings in temperature and other things. So we can grow native plants from seed and it's really easy. It's actually not that difficult. You sow your seeds mostly for the most native plants in the fall or winter, and then they germinate in the spring, which gives you an opportunity to garden in the winter. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so we have lots of great resources on our website at Wild Seed Project, and we just came out with a new um, resource called Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes. It's a guide booklet, a small booklet that um, has 31 native species of trees um, that it details and gives you kind of an ecological lens through which to think about planting native trees. Um, so pick that up if you have the opportunity and um, check out our blog posts on our website because it, we cover quite a range of topics and go in depth um, to get you started. Next slide. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm excited to hear more from our other panelists. Thank you, Anna. That was fantastic and some great resources to follow up on. So I appreciate that. And if you joined us a little bit later tonight, um, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please go ahead and enter any questions you have in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best to get to all of them. At this point, I would like to open it up to Avi Clare, who is the co-founder of Native Gardens of Blue Hill. Thank you, Heather. And um, I like um, also am very excited to be a part of this panel and joining Anna and Eric. So I feel um, very grateful to be a part. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just explain a few things about what we're doing here in Blue Hill. We um, our mission at the Native Gardens of Blue Hill is to create 
gardens of Maine native plants and to demonstrate their beauty and value and to encourage sustainable gardening. So we, um, next slide, we consider ourselves a demonstration garden. Um, we want to demonstrate the beauty of native plants. Uh, we know that habitat loss is one of the main reasons that um, the plants and animals have are endangered and our goal is to encourage people to take small actions and restore habitats by incorporating native plants in, in their own landscapes and to do that in such a way that ecosystem services are improved while they're creating beauty in their own home gardens. Um, we have a very receptive community here in Blue Hill and the surrounding area um, and we feel that many people are getting this message about native plants. It's it's uh, as it's um, it's a topic that's very popular right now, um, and this encourages us to think that we can connect many home garden and gardens across the area and to patch them together into some kind of corridor for of habitat. Um, so there are many many beautiful plants choices for the gardens, and we try to uh, showcase them in. The native garden. We have a campus that's four acres. We have a variety of habitats and that can highlight the different species. And um, I just want to give a shout out right now. These All these um, photographs here are done by uh, one of our volunteers, Martha Moss, and she has been photographing um, for a project that we recently started last year, our phenology project. And um, that project is a chance for us to document bloom times as well as seed ripening times, as one of our goals is to offer seed collection for the community as well. Next slide. We have a lot of volunteer members building this garden. It's 100% volunteer um, effort and there's no staff. And um, we began working on this site in 2016. Uh, from the start, we, uh, in became one of the projects for the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, part of the uh, University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And we also have other community members that join in. The slides on the left show the library garden, which is the only place in the, on the campus that we had to basically start with fresh soils. We um, tried to focus a lot on editing and um, and uh, using what's there rather than um, bringing in non-native soils to a site. But this, because of construction, we share this campus with, I, I should have mentioned, with Bagadoos Music. Um, and they uh, own the property. We're, we're sort of the stewards of the land. We have a, an agreement with them. And so um, this garden, um, was our opportunity to kind of show how to build a garden from scratch. And um, we started planting that garden in 2000, in the spring of 2018. On the right also shows another um, spot on the, on the campus. It's a patio garden. We also get volunteers from the community that are contractors and they will come with some equipment to help um, build something that might take more than just hand labor and um, through grants, we were able to create a trail that was ADA compliant, um, wheelchair accessible, that includes two ADA br uh, bridges. Um, we also um, have a summer house on, on this garden spot, which can act as an information center. So that project started also in the fall of 2018 and we've been slowly building that out. Next slide. Um, we have mentor days every other Friday in the mornings from nine to noon. Um, that's the time when the volunteers come to the garden and help create this. So you can see that there's not a huge amount of time that we have to uh, manage this site, but we, we do get a fair amount of uh, volunteers from the community. And we also, um, sort of show how to create gardens in a, in a less management intensive way where we're using um, cover crops if we need to. We, we did choose to use um, the partridge pea in one spot to help fill some space. And um, 
we're basically sharing with the community ways to work with native plants and um, create gardens in ecological ways. So we've become kind of a, a spot for people to come and learn. Next slide. Um, we hold a lot of workshops to demonstrate sustainable gardening. We do have some seed sowing workshops and um, soil building workshops. The slide on the top left shows um, creating uh, nursery beds and habitat berms using natural materials. We, we consider ourselves a teaching garden and we want to show how you can create a garden with very few inputs you know, using materials that are available locally or naturally on the site, like leaves, um, seaweed, uh, twigs from uh, brush cutting, and um, and we also want to talk about practices that you know. On the lower left, there's a slide of a workshop we recently did showing how to make compost tea. Um, we're working on building compost piles. So we really want to promote the idea of a, a healthy soil food web and um, how plants and soil can work together to create the garden. Um, we also talk a lot about promoting um, experimentation and observation. Next slide. Um, we host an annual plant sale every spring. Um, one of our missions is to support and promote local sustainable nurseries. Um, we also like hope to promote um, the growing of lesser known native plants because um, there is sort of a, a definite plant palette that's out there in the world for native plants. And we try to um, encourage more seed collection of non, uh, the lesser known plants, I should just say, and, and working with the nurseries to um, get them to propagate for us as well. Um, we are this year thinking about doing, planning to do a fall plant sale as well. We've always done our plant sales in the spring. And so this year we're going to start uh, another chance to do another one in the fall. Um, next slide. So um, this year we started a uh, workforce training. Um, we realized that there aren't enough gardeners out in the world that in general, and especially gardeners that really work with the sustainable practices and um, also promoting native plants. So we partnered with the, um, the community college system of Maine, um, specifically Kennebec Valley Community College, and created a pilot workforce training program this year. These are slides from our first cohort this spring. We had um, nine online sessions focused on topics like stewardship, soil health, understanding the landscape, um, water, stormwater management, a lot of topics like that. And we did do two hands-on sessions in Blue Hill um, to demonstrate some of the things we wanted to share with them. Um, we will have our fall cohort starting in September. Um, next slide. And this is the last slide. So I just want to put up our website there, um, let you know that we're open to the public year round from dawn to dusk. Um, people are encouraged to come on our mentor days because that's when we're in the garden working. And if you're not up for volunteering, we're always um, willing to sh show you around, answer any questions. And I'll turn it over to Eric. Thank you, A.B. That was fantastic. And uh, definitely always enjoy a trip to Blue Hill. So this is another good excuse to get up there. Um, so at this point, we're going to turn it over to Eric Topper, who is the Director of Education at Maine Audubon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna and A.B. as well. Great stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, I am Eric from Maine Audubon. Next slide, please. Uh, Maine Audubon is coming into this work uh, from sort of the opposite direction that Anna started, who came from the plants direction. We're coming at this from the wildlife and kind of ended up in the same place from the opposite direction. Uh, that Maine Audubon is here to conserve wildlife and wildlife habitat, and we do that primarily through this three-pronged approach that 
includes doing the conservation work, educating the community around it, and doing the advocacy and policy that will enable lasting change and, and sort of uh, scale up that work. Next slide, please. Uh, Maine Audubon is also, we really ride the connection to Maine's heritage and our connections to the landscape here. And this whole eco eco thing of, you know, Maine Audubon has really always been about the ecology, but also about the economy. We know that birds come here, but so do birders. And so that's what we want to be in the, at the, on the front lines of. Next slide, please. Um, like many conservation organizations and really nonprofits uh, nowadays, but there's been this sort of long quest to figure out what the next phase is and, and conservation has really wrestled with how to engage now that we have all this land, now that we have all these pro programs, why aren't people in communities more engaged? And it's because we haven't done a lot of these things in the history of conservation and, and lots of organizations are, are doing this stuff. Um, the one that, and so uh, that was true for Maine Audubon in 2013 when I started in this role, and that's true, that was true after Black Lives Matter revved up last summer and things like that. And so we're looking for ways to get in communities more engaged in wildlife conservation. And that last point, this idea of point positive is a, is a kind of this idea of additive rather than restrictive. We all have to take shorter showers and drive less and do all this stuff, cut down on all these practices, but there are means of conservation that mean we get to do more of things. And one of those is plant more native plants and grow more habitat connections. Next slide, please. Um, this starts the project that I uh, represent here tonight is the Bringing Nature Home Project named after and advised by Doug Tallamy, who Anna did a great job uh, introducing and mentioning. He is the one that really started this movement around the ecological connections that the plants play, not just plants feeding animals immediately, but this idea that Anna introduced of breeding birds, needing insects in a particular life cycle phase, and the plants can or can't play a critical role. And if you're not making the caterpillars, then you can't enable breeding birds. And so that's a huge thing for Maine Audubon is to enable breeding birds in the summer in Maine. That's what we are here for uh, as Mainers. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is where it's been, we kind of ride the coattails of the pollinator movement and this idea of restoring pollinator habitat, but so much of pollinator conservation is focused solely on feeding adult pollinators. And we want people to remember that there's as this picture depicts, there's a whole birds and bees of butterflies going on here that it's not just feeding the adult pollinators. Next slide. But the pollinators have these other phases of their life cycles that have nothing to do with flowers in bloom. And if you show this picture and you ask people, are these pollinators? That's a really difficult question. They will be when they, after they pupate and become monarch butterflies, but if you just conserve nectar producing plants for when adult but butterflies are around, you're not, you're not actually conserving the species the same way your plastic bird feeders are not actually conserving birds. And so this idea, and, and Anna mentioned the cecropia moth, there are, there are moths and butterflies that don't even have mouth parts. And so they will never be pollinators. Um, and so if we only conserve pollinators, we're missing incredible uh, amounts of opportunity. Next slide, please. But again, the caterpillars for us are not just about making more defoliators. They're about making more food for baby birds. This is what baby birds need. They need caterpillars in May and June and July in our landscapes while their parents are feeding them in the nest, but also in the in most cases for a couple weeks after they leave the nest in July when it gets really loud and really chaotic in terms of bird song. That is all of the fledglings still calling for their parents to bring them caterpillars after they've fledged. It's not just while they're in the nest. So we need our landscapes to make caterpillars. Next slide, please. 
So ways for people to get started, uh, a lot of great ideas and a lot of great resources in both places that we've heard from thus far. Maine Audubon's contribution has been uh, this main native plants.org database. Uh, I think AV threw out the idea of a native plant palette. I would offer the 60 species at main native plants.org as the beginnings of that palette and version two of that where we'll go up to about 110 species um, will in, in include that palette, but will also that website also enables you to query to to adjust your query in a search by growing conditions and things like that. So that's a good resource. And then this time of year, you can put a shop dot in front of me, nativeplants.org, and go to our online store where you can buy these plants, uh, straight species, sustainably sourced. Uh, I can talk more about that if people have questions. Next slide, please. And then the other thing Maine Audubon is doing is kind of a similar version of what AV is doing so well in Blue Hill is this idea of collaborating at a community scale. And I'll just go really quickly because I know we got to get to questions. Um, so Maine Audubon as a larger organization is trying to use our networks and our resources to scale up in addition to supporting people at home in their yards to also support communities doing this at landscape level. Uh, and so step one of that has been to identify locations where we can do this work, but also prioritize demonstrating it and, and getting a lot of eyeballs on it. So we work with entities like the city of Portland to draw circles on uh, maps like this in places like Deering Oaks Park. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that they could do this. We needed to be super cognizant of the other functions of these landscapes, not just the wildlife and the habitat, which we prioritize and always will, but things have to be tidy and pretty and, they and like they have been for hundreds of years. Um, and so we were working in Deering Oaks in a place that had all these, this history and legacy. Next slide, please. But we were willing to make those compromises because of these, the high visibility of these places and that these are gathering places like what Avi is doing and, and her team there. Uh, that picture on the bottom left is the last time Maine had a hundredth year anniversary uh, in 1910 or, or um, when, or 1920, sorry, when uh, the uh, primary state celebration uh, happened at Deering Oaks Park in Portland. Uh, that picture, you see a, a group from the, Wabin, or the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Pleasant Point doing a canoe demonstration in Deering Oaks Park. Um, next slide, please. And then if you have those components and you can also identify some wildlife that you can manage for and actually create those connect, direct connections. And sometimes you get a little bit lucky but when the, when the rarest bird in the country lands in the middle of one of your restoration projects and decides to stay there and a, new, a birder who travels from New York overnight to see this rare bird is standing next to a seventh grader at King Middle School saying, that's what it's all about right there, the great black hawk, that's what it's all about. I agree entirely, that is what it's all about. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've been trying to do this and infiltrate these different landscape designs, but also tackle the challenges that our society has laid in our way unintentionally for making this even harder than it has to be. Uh, this is a women's shelter in Lewiston that I'm helping with the landscape installation. We've channeled lots of Anna's great work. We have a Carex Pennsylvanica lawn there because historic preservation says you have to have lawn in a historic preservation property. Sorry, less lawn, you have to have it. And so we wanted to make that lawn do something other than exotic grasses. And so that whole landscape, all of those little umbrella shapes that normally are exotic species with quoted cultivar names after them have all been replaced and are straight species of Maine natives in that landscape and we got the passing grade from historic preservation. Next slide, please. And then this is some scale projects in, in Portland, a couple photos of the Franklin Street Meadow, uh, which is one example of ways to transition a lawn to a meadow. 
Uh, Anna mentioned smothering it. We spent, spent a year with this giant black tarp uh, smothering this landscape. Uh, it was obliterated when we went to plant there and we sort of wish we would have tried a different thing, but we can get to that later. And then another uh, landscape installation down at Pond Cove Elementary School, student led, led project similar to some of what Avi was showing as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is, I think the next big opportunity and the big uh, challenge to scale up this work is solar arrays. Uh, I'm doing more and more advising on particularly sourcing for large scale solar arrays when you're buying plants 300 at a time or hundreds and hundreds of acres at a time. There are some, some places where we can fulfill those needs and other places where we need to compromise and say, you know what, if we can't do 300 acres all the way, can we do 50 acres all the way? And can we work on scaling that up? And so lots of great opportunities. And this is a really cool place where science is sort of the common language. Developers are bringing ecologists now to the table to help get these projects through. And then the municipalities are showing up and the other entities are showing up with ecologists as well to make sure that things are, that are, are not gonna leave lasting impacts as we're making quick decisions. And Maine Audubon and others are wanting to have a role being being part of those conversations to get to how we do this, not if, not when, but how, and how can we use all of this investment as a way to help scale up and overcome some of the barriers. Next slide, please. And then this is another challenge that we're tackling now is this other, this idea of true habitat restoration in really public settings. This is a project at the entrance to Willard Beach in South Portland, probably one of Maine's busiest beach accesses in the whole state and a whole, uh, this was a massive backhoe and bulldozer invasive species removal. Not a single drop of pesticide was used, but it was a major construction project. And now the work is to restore the habitat, to restore the plants that, we, that did remain, species like Northern Bay, Bayberry, Black Cherry, which Anna showed us pictures of, uh, all of those were species that we found covered in multiflora rose and bittersweet and the other invasives. And so we're working hard to, to ramp up the, the number of species of, of, or the number of individuals of those species there. Next slide. And then this is the last couple slides I'll just leave you with. In addition to the actual plantings, Maine Audubon is really about the interpretation and making sure that the community knows what's going on and can have a role. So here's a couple examples of the different signage uh, that are on projects as they're happening. Uh, that meadow on the right is a four-year-old meadow in Portland, the Western Prom, uh, where we're just kind of taking a slow approach and that's been a little bit experimental. Uh, the photo on the left is that Deering Oaks project with some of the interpretive uh, interpretation. Uh, next slide, please. And for those of you, if you want to try it, this has been a great learning for us, a QR code. If you want to point your smartphone at that QR code right now and scan the code, and then when you go to the YouTube, please pause it and you can watch it later, but you'll see a video that explains uh, the student, what the students are doing at that particular site. And we've fallen in love with QR codes. Mainly, that was something I was adamantly against for a long time as an environmental educator is people walking around on their devices in these habitats. I wanted no part of that until I tried to deal with translation and other accessibility. And there's no better way to do that when, with a, than with a QR code and tap into all the accessibility features in those smart devices. So somebody who speaks a different language can use their phone to translate the messages that we're trying to communicate. And, and not in a place with Portland where literally we have to translate to 25 different languages if we want to cover everyone in our community. Um, and to do that via smart devices is a, is a new, new tool that opens up some resources there. So with that, I, there's one more slide that has our address, but I don't need to narrate it. Um, at, with that, I think we're turning it over to questions and answers. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric. That was really inspiring. That was fantastic. Um, we. We don't have a ton of time left and we have a lot of awesome questions. So I'm gonna start with um, 
you talked a bit, uh, one of your examples, Eric, was putting black plastic over some sod to turn that into a new garden. And I know that a lot of folks, a lot of us have lawns and want to start taking some steps store, towards creating more native landscapes. So I'm curious if you do have a lawn and you're interested in creating more uh, native plantings, what do you recommend? How do people get started? And I'll open that up to anyone who wants to answer it. Yeah, Anna, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I might jump in there because I mentioned lawns. So um, yeah, I think for the homeowner, one of the best things to do is to smother it, but um, in a method called um, sheet mulching or lasagna layering. Um, I really like that method because you're not having to use any plastic or inorganic materials. What you do is you put down, I would say it's good to do it in the like late fall, you could do it in the winter if the ground is bare or spring, uh, put down um, some cardboard, make sure it's not the glossy part of the cardboard and take off any tape there is. Um, and I would do a good layer, sometimes two layers is, is helpful. Um, then on top of that, you can use either aged um, mulched leaves or aged uh, bark mulch. And um, there's not really a need for um, you know soil input unless it's a very, very poor area and you um, want to add organic matter to the soil, enrich the soil a little bit, or you know, there's no real need for um, compost either. So if you let that kind of bake on top of the, and break down on top of the lawn for the growing season, then you can plant it into it in the fall. And the fall is a really great time to plant because the temperatures are starting to cool, plants are starting to go dormant, um, and they're using, they're taking up less water. They're not needing as much care. Um, you don't have the heat of the summer. So um, then in the spring, they're often, you know, going, they're ahead of the game. But you want to plant them early enough so that their root systems have a chance to establish so they don't heave up over the winter. So I'd say August and, and September are great times to plant in the fall. Great, thank you. Anyone want to add anything to that? I think, um, you know, depending on how big the area is and how ambitious you are, you know, that's a big issue too. And so one, another method is to stop mowing. And um, even though it might not be 100% native because there are European grasses in your lawn and other things, at least um, what I've discovered is that there are a lot of native plants that are going to come also. And um, just be on the alert for invasive things. Um, so some of the real common invasive things are things like bittersweet and um, maybe uh, honey, that uh, Japanese honeysuckles, there's a suite of species that can show up a lot of times in a sunny location. Um, so I would just uh, be on that alert. But it's easy to just stop mowing a very large expanse of lawn. And as Anna said earlier, um, edges, mowed edges can often in, uh, consider, you know, sort of signal, this is a garden, this is, we keep it, we are, we are intentionally managing this. Great. Um, it's, it's great to learn about the native plant finder resource that you have at Maine Audubon. I'm wondering if there are other places that you would recommend as well, where people who are interested in purchasing native plants can get them. Um, I think like Go Botany or Native Plant Trust has really good resources and they do also have a, and Anna should be talking about this, they have a plant a nursery as well. Um, That's right. Um, so Go Botany is kind of, it's like an online key, which is basically a way that you, through a process of elimination, you can um, identify a plant. And I love Go Botany because um, you just, you, you don't have to know a lot about plants. You don't have to know botanical terms because you can just hover over a word and it will give you the definition and you can just answer whatever questions you know the answers to. Um, so that's for identifying plants. And then Native Plant Trust also has a garden plant finder um, that you can look up plants and you, know, you can look them up by conditions that your you know, sun and soil conditions and, and find plants that way. 
um, that's going to give you horticultural information on plants, the native plant finder or garden finder. Um, but then uh, they also have um, a really great retail area um, at Garden in the Woods and at their Nasami farm in Waitley, Massachusetts. Um, on our website and Wild Seed Project, uh, if you search where to find native plants, um, we just actually updated our list of nurseries and plant sales um, throughout New England and beyond um, where you can find native plants. And we tried to emphasize seed grown native plants when possible and uh, nurseries that don't use systemic pesticides, which is important to look for. I think that should go to the top of your list when you're trying to find native plants um, because those are things like neonicotinoids, which can stay in the vascular system of the plant for years. And so you might um, bring your plant home and plant it. And then the caterpillars and other insects and herbivores that might feed on the leaves would be ingesting that. So that's really important to consider. And a lot of nurseries use them. So it's a good idea to kind of call up your nursery either on a rainy day or in the winter when they're not so busy and ask them, um, you know, about their practices and if they grow plants without systemic pesticides. Great, thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions on reintroducing native lupin and the endangered Carner blue butterfly to Maine. Is it plausible? Well, I know in Blue Hill, we're, we've been planting the native lupin. I don't know if we're yet attracting the right, the right pollinators, but um, I do want to say that it, it prefers kind of a gravelly soil. And um, we have really been surprised at how much reseeding is happening um, on, on the plants that we've put in. And um, so I'm really encouraged to say that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I also find them to be prolific self-sowers if they're in a good spot of, like Avi said, a, a dry, sandy or gravelly soil and full sun. Um, they're very easy to grow, but it's just that the habitat, um, those kinds of, um, you know, barrens uh, are actually, you know, have been taken over by development because, you know, plant uh, developing on sandy soil is kind of ideal where it's really well drained. So um, that's the main reason that they're, they're in decline. Um, but I think they're very easy if you have the right conditions. Can I just add that like the question, it, it's, it was sort of a trick question that I want to double click on because the question was, can we restore native lupin? And I don't think anyone of us can claim to know, but we should all grow native lupin because we can still host that caterpillar. Like, so I don't, I think like if people are trying too hard to restore the plants and they lose track of just growing one of them, uh, then they'll lose sight of those potential benefits because the plants don't need them to be, or the insects don't need them to be restored. They just need to find one of them when they're ready to lay an egg. So um, we should grow them without fretting about restoring the species. I, I love the theme of accessibility that I'm hearing tonight, that it's not an, an all or nothing approach, that there, there's a lot we can do by starting small and so I'm curious um, if you have any recommendations for people who are interested in getting started to adding more native plants to their landscape, whether there are certain species you would recommend or any sort of advice on getting started. It's any plant and really just experiment. Don't be afraid. And if, I mean, we often talk about the right plant for the right, you know, the right place for the right plant, but a lot of times things can be pushed, you know, if a catalog says this is a shade plant or this is a wet plant, that's oftentimes because that in nature, that plant is not having to compete with other things. But as a gardener, we're managing the landscape and we can sort of kind of give it the right conditions. You know, we can stop, we can sort of uh, be the person or the, the entity that's intervening and and keeping other things from competing with the plant. So for instance, a plant that says it wants wet swamps, doesn't, it's like a swamp azalea, it doesn't need, I have a beautiful swamp azalea that blooms beautifully in my driveway. So, you know, it doesn't need a swamp. And so we're just, just 
experiment and and observe and play around, just do it. I totally uh, agree. I, I, um, I, I think that um, I've killed so many plants in my life. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's, it's something you don't need to be precious about each individual plant. Um, of course they cost money um, to buy, but um, that's why, you know, growing uh, planting small plants is a good idea. It's, it's good for both um, the plants to be able to adapt to the soils um, better, but also so small trees, seedlings, rather than getting big ball and burlap trees. Um, and then small plants are gonna be more cost-effective or growing your plants from seed. And then you don't have to worry about each individual one. You can just play around and experiment. Any advice for transplanting native plants? Mm. <laughs> Find the right spot. <laughs> that's uh, my that's my only advice is get the, get it to the right spot and the plant will do its thing. Get it. They just have to get in the right spot and they get have to get started. And if they need a whole lot of love and it's not the right plant or the right spot, someone else wants the spot. Mm -hmm. A bit of experimentation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there? Oh, oh go sorry. ahead. <laughs> um, I'd say if you asked a horticulturist, um, then they'd probably say spring is really the best time to transplant and to plant in general. And that's true because generally it's the rainier season and it's cooler before things get too hot. Um, so I think that's ideal, if, especially to not be using too much water. Um, in the summer when there might be droughts. Um, but plant, a lot of plants can be transplanted kind of any time. And uh, that's another one of those rules that's not really hard and fast either. Mm -hmm. um, the fall is a good time and maybe early fall. So it gets a chance to kind of set its roots before the winter. Um, might need a little bit of extra mulch, you know, leaf mulch or something to keep it from heaving. But um, and there's so many resources out there too. I, I would say go to the library, read books. There are some plants that are a little harder than others and just learn about it, ask other gardeners. All right, one final question and then I'm sorry, but we're running, we are out of time. Um, are there any main plants that will attract monarch butterflies? <laughs> oh yeah, we have yeah. Um, so, so many species. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, almost any nectar producing flower will feed a monarch butterfly, but you have to have one of three or five species of milkweed, depending on which map, range map you're referring to, that you need to grow in order to make baby monarchs. Um, and that's hosting their caterpillars. They will only lay eggs on a species of in the Asclepius genus, which you have to have. So if you see monarchs, on your flowers, that's just like cardinals on your bird feeder. It's not the whole package. You're just feeding the grown-ups. Awesome. Thank you. That was that was a, a new learning for me tonight. So I appreciate that. I loved the slide about the, the baby birds. Very compelling. Gave me chills. Um, so we are out of time um, for this evening. So Let's see, what do I need to tell you? I want to thank our sponsors once again, Royal River Heat Pumps and Bath Savings. Thank you to Maggie Perkins, who you can't see, but she's been behind the scenes making everything flow so smoothly. Want to thank our panelists, especially for being here with us tonight, sharing your expertise. And um, we have a special thank you gift that we'll be mailing to each of you. I hope you like chocolate. We're, Big fans of Dean Sweets, and we'll be sending you some treats from Dean Sweets, and also a complimentary subscription to Green and Healthy Maine Homes magazine for either yourself or a gift subscription. And uh, if anyone here with us has questions that we didn't get to today, we will include contact information for our panelists um, in the follow up email, along with a link to the recording, which will also be on our website in a few days. Um, and we are finalizing the program for our fall session starting in September. So stay tuned for those. They'll all be posted on our website. Um, and lastly, you'll see a brief survey pop up after the webinar. And we'd love to hear your feedback on today's session to help us craft future programming that meets your needs. So once again, thank you to our panelists and hope you have a great evening. Thank you, Heather. Thanks. It's nice to see you, Anna, and meet you, Eric.
Thank you. Nice Thanks to talk so to both of you and